Welcome. Remind me at the end of class and I'll record your um, attendance and then the rest of you that need to add codes, come see me after class and we'll do your so remember, this is not graded material. It's simply kind of a springboard for conversation and to help me get to know where you're coming from and your background. So the first question, have you ever been exposed to philosophy? Um, and now that can come in various formats and forms. That could be uh, cartoons, cinema, literature, uh, music. Uh, Anything or read philosophical works? If so, right. So, show of hands. Who thinks they've been exposed to philosophy? <coughs> okay. Um, yes, sir. What? Oh, uh, about a year or so ago, um, I was in Mexico with my uncle and he talked to me about Plato. Oh, uh, Plato. Yeah, Plato. In Spanish, Platon, right? You know that? Platon. Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'll, we'll be doing Plato. Um, and Plato's nice because it's in the form of a dialogue, usually always a dialogue. And so that makes it a bit more enjoyable, oftentimes. Um, who else would like to share? Yes, sir. I actually have a weird uh, ritual where I reread the mythos of this every year on my birthday, just because existential crises are a fun way to start the year. Yeah, right. Camus, yeah, is a famous uh, existentialist. And uh, rolling the rock up forever on the hill. Actually, got like one of his lines tattooed. Wow, nice one. Got like, really geeky. Really, <laughs> really geeky. Okay, geeks are allowed in this class. Be sure. Um, who else would like to share? Yes. Is Charles Darwin a philosopher? Uh huh. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and as we answered the question yesterday, I. Was it that asked the question was really good. How does science relate to philosophy? Notice that uh, up until very recently, within the last 30 years, 40 years, almost every scientist was a philosopher. Um, and we'll get into why that's so. Who else would like to share? Doesn't everything have to do with philosophy? Or yes. <laughs> nice one. Yeah, you can, uh, you can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good one. Um, yeah, and we'll see. I don't want to. I don't want to do a spoiler alert, so I'm trying to. I keep wanting to say something. I have to hold back because it's going to be answered in other questions later on. So, but we'll we'll answer that. Yeah, I don't mean to take you up on the egg, but yeah, just point. Oh, I really do that. Isn't that strange how these things keep working out? Equal number of handouts for the people who need it, right? Um, and then it must be a profit. Yeah. Should, I, should I try my luck? Like, uh, Okay, you're going to cross your foot over. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, I'll post an announcement. Um, basically, what I'm going to assign is those two readings that are on the files. Okay. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Okay, take care. So I'll tell the doctor hello. Sounds good. Uh, who else would like to share? Um, I I've listened to. weird because I just, uh, I didn't even know I had an Alan Watts book, and then I was looking through my bookcase, and I was like, Alan Watts, and there was uh, something on pantheism, actually. Um, yeah, Alan Watts is a big, anybody else? Does talking with family and friends about stuff deeply count as well? Yes, of course it does. Yeah. Does your family do that? Yeah. Nice. Ergo sum. Did you know you signed up for Latin class? No. But uh, the, look, this is quite important in philosophy. These kind of technical words that go back to um, either Greek or Latin. Um, learning these kind of foundational languages, even if they're just phrases, really helps you. Um, even when you do standardized tests, like if you're going to go on to graduate school or something like that, um, learning 
la I mean, you could figure out so much stuff in Latin and Greek. Just, uh, did you ever see uh, my big fat Greek wedding? Remember the father? Give me any word and I will, and he just start making up stuff. That comes from uh, Don, from Lucia, from, and he goes this, and of course he's, he's full of it, but maybe he gets some of it right. Um, who else would like to share? I was saying uh, the movie Full Metal Jacket, The Duality of Man, comes up. Yeah, that's a really good. Yeah. How about any cartoons? Tom and Jerry. Really? What? No, I'm oh, jeez, I didn't see that. <laughs> well, if we're going to talk about cartoons, um, have you watched Rick and Morty? Uh -huh. I was just going to throw out Rick and Morty. Um, the Simpsons? Yeah. Uh, South Park? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, I think uh, some of the writers of Simpsons actually had major influence. So, after, after this class, um, I don't remember if he did, or, um, but maybe I'll have to look. After this class, you'll start seeing all kinds of stuff. And also, I like to take kind of contemporary culture and cinema, films, movies, music, and use that as uh, kind of a vehicle to, to talk about philosophical concepts. Uh, because we're immersed in it, right? Maybe we haven't all read the same books, but we know about the cinema and music that's out there. And so it makes it a good medium for uh, communicating philosophical ideas. So, if you don't mind talking about that sort of stuff. Anybody else before we move on to the next question? Now, the reason why I ask these questions is that, so I was exposed to philosophy my senior year. We had somebody come in and they would teach uh, logic and kind of control philosophy. And I had never heard of that before, like that, that kind of, I knew it, you know, I had a kind of a rough idea what I thought philosophy was, which was very, very strange. Um, I thought it was something maybe very impractical things, but kind of witisms, uh, proverbial phrases, um, maybe something that uh, you would write in fortune cookies or something like that. <laughs> so let me give you an example. Uh, Somebody says, we have to make enough time to do such and such, to clean the house. And then the philosopher jumps in and says, you don't make time, time makes us. And everybody's like, oh, so <laughs> We don't really know what that means, but it sounds nice. And so I remember my senior year going, oh, I'm going to try to be a philosopher, and writing out all these stupid witisms. Right? <laughs> Now, once you get introduced to philosophy, it changes. Now, what's really funny is what other people thought philosophy was. So the big one's always, oh, you're studying philosophy. We're not going to get a job doing that. What kind of job are you going to get? Um, that is the lie that our boomer generation, the parents, right? The boomers um, have told us that you go to college to get a job. It's stupid. You don't go to college to get a job. You go to college to get educated. Um, aside from any technical kind of certificates or something like that, is there any degree that just lands you a job? No. Who gets you the job? Oh my goodness. Welcome. My former student, Matt. This, is, uh, this was your class a semester ago. Yeah. So you can ask Matt any questions about what, so you still have time to get out, right? Uh, How hard was the final? Study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do all your homework. Do all your homework, right? We, we rehearsed this before class. <laughs> Matt. No. 
I do have the video. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll show you this. They did a really good. So remember, I told you I have group presentations. So they did an excellent presentation. Yeah, I'm recording for. Oh, fun. You can be my. I'll just show you for a minute. Uh, they did an excellent skit with uh, that was really really fun and enjoyable. So. And I'll share with you some ideas, too, to kind of brainstorm of successful group presentations. But the idea is to have fun. Did you have fun, Matt, putting it together? Oh, absolutely. See? And you learned a but lot, too. Start early. Don't try to rush. It doesn't work. Yeah. At remember all. we talked about the devil and the demons? What was the, what was the demon that got the, the applause for the devil? Yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. I still have my notebook. What's that? I'm looking at my notebook right now. I still have it in my backpack from your class. Wow. So, it's only you that are going to be able to get the job. So, you have to understand, I'm going to college to educate myself and empower myself so that I will be best equipped. That's the better way to think about it. Um, a piece of paper is not going to do anything to you. You're going to do something. And I will provide an argument that out of all the things that you can study, it's philosophy that will put you the best for what? For anything, for everything. As you pointed out, isn't everything related to philosophy? Absolutely it is. And I'll say a little bit more about that when we get further down in the questions. But it was always interesting to me to hear what the boomers would say about, um, oh, philosophy. Uh, I had a neighbor, oh, philosophy. So you think about how, what do you guys do? Think about how we could be uh, on a planet that's really a cell on somebody's skin. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> that's called drug abuse. <laughs> about philosophy. We'll make, philosophy is about making distinctions, right? When is somebody, need to be in a mental institution versus when are they doing philosophy. That's a good example. If you think that we're living on a flat earth or... <laughs> yeah, or if you're a... Uh, yeah, that's, what, that's, that's a good one. If you think that we're... Well, there was actually a Simpsons episode, right? That was... I think uh, they're on the planet and it zooms out and then it's like a cell on and it kind of comes all the way back. Um, tricky concept, but does it make it true just because it's trippy? No, absolutely not. Um, also, the famous one, oh, you philosophers, you study philosophy. Oh, I don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> really? Again, mental health problems or drug abuse. Okay, if you're running around thinking that you don't exist, yeah, you need some counseling. <laughs> Okay, that's not what philosophers do. That does get back to, it's sort of like the telephone game. Remember that from school? Yeah. You whisper something in uh, you, your, the next person's ear and it goes through like this, and then it comes out completely different at the end. Uh, well, it starts like, I believe, my theory of this is that it was something like that. So Descartes was trying to find out what he could know for certain what was incapable of even being doubted without contradicting himself. And he says, well, I think, well, try to do it. Let's play a role game here. Let's, uh, I mean, a uh, role play. You question your own existence. Action, go. Say, I, I don't know if I exist. Go. Who said that? Who asked the question? <laughs> Who was it? Was it this? Did this ask a question? Was it you? There, yeah, see, see where the contradiction? Me, the person that doesn't exist. So you're asserting your existence and then immediately going, but I don't. Parlor tricks. Stupid. It's worse than parlor tricks. It's just a straight up blatant contradiction. Contradictions, by definition, cannot be true. And so Descartes concludes the one thing that I know for certain, anytime I'm thinking, I exist. Now somehow during the telephone game through centuries, 
um, it comes out down at the end that philosophers don't think they exist. They're all running around. <laughs> How many jokes about philosophy? But uh, we can't come into class until we prove the classics in these kinds of things. Okay? <laughs> it's like stereotypes. That we have to get rid of all these. There's always stereotypes and stigmas with anything that we have to get rid of. Was that theory before or after he thought that even were tricky to believe in reality? So he uses, and we'll, we'll go over Descartes. He uses, he's not actually thinking demons, but he's thinking that um, what could I imagine a scenario that is so bad that I could just see my money with Well, if you had an evil genius, a scientist messing with your brain, um, or a demon throwing an idea, making this seem um, that it's out there when it's not. Matrix, right? Where do you think the Matrix gets its ideas? From Descartes, Plato. So here's another illustration of cinema using philosophy. So that's why I like to ask questions like this. This is an intro class, so some of you might have had the experience with philosophy, but I'm sure, I'm positive, that your ideas as we go along through this are going to change. About So I like to hear, how take like a baseline, right? Let's take a baseline reading of what we think, and look how we progress, and should hopefully progress, right? Not digress, right? We don't want that. Okay, so, if somebody asked you today or after class, what is philosophy? Oh, you signed up for philosophy. What kind of job are you going to get with that? Uh, what is philosophy? What are you going to say? What is philosophy? What do you think? I mean, if you break it down, it's like the, the love of knowledge. The love of wisdom. Wisdom. Which is type of knowledge. We'll get another good one. Yeah. I was about to say, you know, it's sort of on the same line with what you said. I don't know what's going to be so I don't know. Um, yeah, your name tag? Hold it up. <laughs> I think it's a new name, but I thought we were doing it. You think we're writing that voice to you? Yeah. All right. Probably just text it. <laughs> Anyways, it's the technological age. We don't need papers and books anymore. We just got to. I just think it's going to like the study of cloud or something. Who else would like to share? Okay, good, very good. What else? Thoughts. Thoughts? Thinking about thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? What else? We have day to day life functions around us. Close to month to month life. Mm -hmm. Nice one. Mm -hmm. Year to year, month to month. I just had uh, questions about the unexplainable. Okay. Anybody else want to share? So, the reason why I'm using science um, and asking questions about science too. So, Aristotle has this famous example of. Let's say, you know what something obscure is, it's not very clear, somebody doesn't understand it. Um, now, if you have something that's not quite clear and you want to ex explain that to somebody, what you don't want to do is go to something even more complicated. Let me give you an example. A child says, wow, that's so neat how the bike you know, runs around, and how, how, does the, how does that work? What we don't want to do, so it's, it's, it's convoluted and it's obscure to the child. What you don't want to do is say, well, let me give you a crash course in mechanics, right? Newtonian mechanics, or worse, quantum mechanics, right? And the kid's like, that doesn't help, does it? If something's unclear, you want to use something more clear, more certain to explain. So, well, like the, the ball roll, oh, I get it, okay, and then you explain. So, at this point, if philosophy, what it is, and what it's attempting to do, is unclear to us, we don't want to go to, and people do this all the time, right? When you're talking with somebody, give some example where you're like, what? 
that's just making it 10 times worse. We want to go to something more clear. Uh, what seems to be more clear, as I stated last class, although we may not all be doing science, we live in a scientific age. We know what science is. We can point it out and know what science isn't. So when we start to use that as an, a clear example to illumine what's not so clear, it's quite helpful. So that's why I'm doing that. We can do this kind of compare and contrast. What does philosophy do? What does science do? What is, and go back and forth to get a clearly delineated idea of what each one is, so hopefully at the end of this we can provide a working definition. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to work. So that's why I'm doing this. How would you define science? Somebody asked you. And that's interesting too. Sometimes it's a lot easier to, for example, what is a car? The first thing somebody's going to do probably point to it. Okay, that's an example of a car, but the, is that the definition of a car? No. It's much more difficult to give a definition, right? Well, what do you, how do you define a car? That's a, so, how would we define science? What is science? Knowledge backed by evidence. Okay. Uh, what? What did you say? Uh, I was going to say the exact thing. She just told your thoughts. That philosophy stealing thoughts. I was thinking maybe uh, observations that lead to hypothesis that lead to theory, theories about how the world works around. Yep. What else? Uh, a question driven, evidence based understanding of how the natural world works. Yep. Who else would like to just add? I, I, did, I guess I don't know. Um, kind of. Uh, Defining the existence and shows by some reasoning behind everything when you live an object. Okay. Um, living or um, um, just existing on the object. Uh, okay, maybe this turns unfamiliar to empirical. Does anybody know what the word empirical is or what it's synonymous to? That's squiggly tilde called. Um, means similar to or like. Somebody says it's empirical. It's an empirical fact. What do they mean? But any of your five senses. So that's a really good. Sometimes people use the word empirical is synonymous with physical or material. Now, if you ask me all what material physical, then you could answer what is capable. Of being detected through your five senses. And absolutely every material and physical thing is what we call concrete. This is a philosophical term. The antonym of concrete is abstract. So Think of when you hear the word concrete, you think of what? So, yeah. So that might be helpful. That it's helpful. It's uh, as a former philosophy professor said, it's touchy feely stuff. Concrete material, abstract, or ideas, things that you can't touch, taste, and see. Okay, so that's the distinction between. So very good. That's right. Um, so this is asking the question. So there's many different types of sciences. And oftentimes we distinguish uh, the hard or empirical sciences as opposed to soft sciences. Has anybody heard that terminology before? Yeah. Are you practicing hard science, bro? Or are you soft? 
Um, no, it's not really like that. But does anybody want to give, well, we could write up. I'll put soft science And you can give me examples. What do you think a hard one of the hard sciences are? Biology. Biology, yeah. The biology up there. So hard will be synonymous again with empirical. Or sometimes called the positive sciences. And it's not like optimistic. We're just so positive about how things are. Biology. Who else wants to give an example? Or something that would be a hard science? Physics. Chemistry, physics, got it. Yes. What science? some similarities because we're calling them sciences. Yeah, they have all the I think like for the soft sciences compared to the hard sciences, the soft sciences are bounded because of constant change. Like yeah, the theories behind them, the awareness that we have of them are updated. Um, and the hard sciences hold on with that current. Yeah. Man, it's all these spoiler alerts. It's do you know how hard it is for me to hold my tongue? Huh. Um, that's like almost there. But that's good that you guys are doing that means that you're following along uh, the track of reasoning to the connecting the dots. You're just going soft sciences are talking about the You're you're getting to so the the hard sciences all use so they're empirical. What do we say empirical is? What is capable of being detected through your five senses? It uses what kind of methodology? The, the scientific, scientific method. Um, it tends to emphasize exactly what can be observed, measured, verified tangibly and empirically. Um, well, the soft sciences use a little bit of that too, but not all the way. They've gone soft on us, right? <laughs> they just haven't given it known. And because they're using, so you get this kind of mix between, they, psychology uses the scientific, it uses these methodologies borrowed from the, but it tends to, like you said, um, be a lot more immersed within conceptual theories. So are you a Jungian? 
Are you a Freudian? Are you see? Those are two different, very, very different types of concepts. I mean, uh, theories. So we can say soft sciences are theories and hard sciences are facts. What are you guys saying? Really, I, I, I know the answer, but I want to hear what you, you guys What do you guys think? Again, and we don't have to nail it completely down. We can kind of be pointing it in, in the right direction. So you can be like, yeah, I can kind of see how there's something to that. Well, I'm, I'm on like psychology and like anthropology and all that. It's all the differences among very uh, different groups and different people. Whereas with chemistry, you put you know one of you know one of this, one of that, and you'll end up with the same thing pretty much every time. You know, more repeatable. Like this. Yeah, we're not going to go find to go to a chemistry class and be like, well, what chemical food? Well, I uh, subscribe to oil. Um, it's like really. Yeah. Uh, that's something very. That's a very interesting point. Whereas you go to any of these, um, you're going to have all types of different theories and schools that you would belong to, or something like that. So that's an excellent distinction. Whereas science tends to require that universal agreement. Uh, and you, for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think the difference between the empirical sciences and philosophy might be? Remember, philosophy wouldn't traditionally fit into either one of these. So it's not it's neither considered in contemporary terms a soft or a hard science. So this is this kind of back and forth. We'll say, uh, what does science attempt to do? And then, well, does philosophy attempt to do the same thing? Yes or no, in what ways? What do you think science attempts to do? Now notice attempting to do something. Attempting to slam dunk and doing it are two different things. Uh, that's an important distinction. So I'm not asking what is science actually doing, but what does it attempt to do? No, it might end up accomplishing what it attempts to, but first things first, right? I think no one's understanding and observing naturally. Okay, good. Good. Yes? Can you to convert something to the truth? Okay, good. Science explains why things happen in a certain way. Okay. All three of those questions, could we say the same in philosophy? Does philosophy attempt to understand nature? say is maybe is it completely limited or can it go beyond that maybe again it's fine at this point to say maybe I don't know there's my best attempt at answering that uh, then you would put uh, what was your answer again um, to to confirm something does philosophy attempt to do that Is science concerned with facts? Yes. Or is it concerned with the land of make believe? <laughs> Sorry. Um, facts? 
Did you ever see that, that about the crazy little kid from the 80s? It's got that stupid bowl cut. Yeah. I think he ate those things. Um, yeah. My brother had one of those. It's like child abuse. And he's like, ooh, the land of maple. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do you remember that? That's right. But it couldn't do that. <laughs> Feel free to use uh, memes, YouTube videos, yes. or cinemas, that anything, comics, to make your point. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, it does sound good. Uh, what about philosophy? What well, it could be concerned with facts? No, less so. Somewhat. Yes, and no. I know that uh, maybe on like thinking about how that fact came to be a fact or. Oh, well, that's interesting. See that? See what he did right there? Inception. Did you see Inception? I think like one common thing a lot of the different philosophies have is it's more important to be asking the question than just to read the answer. Let me ask you this question. Why do we ask questions? Oh, damn. <laughs> Again, so what I did right there to, th this is what you want to do, this is kind of dialectic where somebody puts forth a position and then you have a rebuttal. And this kind of back and forth helps us kind of narrow into. Otherwise we'd be in the echo chamber. Yeah, that sounds nice. Sure, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. No, you want this kind of pushback because then you can respond to that and each response hopefully is kind of narrowing into the truth. So. Sometimes I'll kind of play devil's advocate, throw something out for you to consider. Yeah, that's right. You argue that. By the way, arguments in philosophy are a good thing. Often people are like, they're so, they're so argumentative. We're going to this argument, right? Okay, that means something different. What about science dealing with theories? Does it? Yes. 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 What about philosophy? Yes. yes. I'm not sure. What do you think a theory is? Is it proven yet? No, it's not proven. Not proven. I say to my mother, when, anytime my parents tell me something, like, that's an interesting theory that can be proven. Or like, I was telling you that I get the car. I'm like, yeah, but that's an interesting project. <laughs> now, what's going to be really strange, let me give you, does anybody know what the word etymology means? The origin of word, the study of the origin of word. Absolutely. Anytime you hear ology, it's the study of, and the origin or meaning of words. So theory comes from the Greek word theoria. I bet you have no clue what that means, theoria in Greek. I was just going to ask me to look real quick. Absolutely. Thank you. With my blessing. <laughs> It means knowledge. In Greek. Isn't that funny? One of these days I'm gonna get a Greek student in my class. I know what that means. And they're gonna end up schooling me in Greek. Now the Greeks have many different words for knowledge because they're obsessed with it. That's all they're thinking about all the time. Do you know what the Aleuts and Inuits are? Have you ever heard of that? They're natives. Yes. It's a correct term. I don't think they like to be called what term? Yeah. So, and they're two separate, because it fails to, it's like, oh, you people, right? This kind of, it's like, well, there's differences, right, between Aleuts and Inuits. Those are two different tribes of people. So the Alouettes and Inuits, do you know how many different words they have for snow? Yeah, it's good enough that you said lots. A big number. Why? Why would they have all these different words for snow? Well, because I think in their language, I remember watching a video on this, like in their language it's similar to German where they paired the two words together. So when they would say like 
Yeah, like yeah. snow, they pair it into one word. So if anything describing snow would get paired up with snow is vice. You know what that is? Um, why would they need to pair so many different words together for snow? Do we? Yeah. Well, they're surrounded about it uh, around snow. Um, it's their reality. Um, they're constantly there's probably different types of snow and different distinction. So if there's different realities, you have to have different words to be able to distinguish between that. So isn't there a bit of a similarity going on with the ancient Greeks? They have all these different words for knowledge. Wonder why? Could they possibly because they're thinking about it a lot? They're immersed in a culture that's obsessed with knowledge. Possible. Awesome. Yeah. So, and each one will mean something different. There's episteme, theoria, proesis, oesis, oesis. All these different forms, uh, are different words for the word knowledge. So, this is something I'm going to show. Even with the word science, I'm going to break down the etymology. Words change meanings over over the centuries. Don't they? they take on new. Um, so a lot of these, but it helps to kind of trace back the history, gives a sort of context. Remember what I was saying before? It's good not to jump in the middle of a conversation. Start from the beginning with the context. That's why we like to take a historical approach to philosophy. Um, we don't want to jump straight into midway and miss something. So it's good too to be able to, even if words change over time, to be able to trace back their etymologies so you understand exactly how it progressed and came to get the sort of meaning that it has. Now, oh, here's another one. Is what does practical mean? What do you, what do you take that into mean? Oh, yeah, that's that's really really good. So the person's really practical. Useful. Useful. Wow, you guys are really good. What else? I heard somebody's back. Hands on. Yeah. Okay. Now name a, a major or field of study that you'd say, yeah, very practical. Engineering comes my straight to hands on. Doing, making, art. Art? What would you say? Art, is it practical or, or not practical? Yeah, it's, that's a good distinction. So practical comes from the word, great, praxis. Praxis means practices. <laughs> So it's practical, going back to our practice, is more than just doing. Um, it, I, I like somebody that said usefulness. It takes on use. So in many senses, um, although art is a making and doing, this goes back to the word technique. So an artist must have technique. And technique comes from the word technique. Where we get technology too. And techne to make to do. But so is so there's, there's some overlap there. But it seems to be that praxis is a type of knowledge that the Greeks thought that praxis was knowledge but a knowledge of how. Uh, how in the sense that it would be useful. So oftentimes people will say, but art shows, other than being able to sell it, um, art has no more use than pure appreciation of beauty, aesthetics. So oftentimes it's made the argument it's the least practical of all of those that there's not much you can do other than just behold, ecce in Latin. Behold the beauty of the 
Now somebody's like, well, I'll take that piece of art and I'll make it into a, a desk and a support for the, it's like, you're misusing it, right? That's not what it was intended to. It's not supposed to be a, a doorstop. It's not supposed to be, right? it's supposed to be appreciated for the beauty. And in that sense, it's very impractical. Um, so we have two antonyms here. Practical versus theoretical. So what would be uh, a discipline that's very theoretical? So it seems to be if practical practices to do, to make, to make useful, uh, what would be theoretical would be not useful for making or doing anything. Like the piece of art, it's not, it's not supposed to make something or do something. It's supposed to be appreciated. Um, anything that you can think about that the, yeah, that's not so practical, it's very theoretical. <coughs> or let me put it this way, let's just go to the question. Would you consider science to be more practical or theoretical? What about philosophy? More practical or theoretical? Right. Now here's the question going a bit, de uh, a bit deeper than what does it attempt to do, what do you think science actually accomplishes, if anything? That's good, yeah. Mathematician can also be a father, a 
you can be an artist. But a mathematician as being a mathematician, why do you think they're studying numbers? They're not engineers. Mathematicians as mathematicians are not engineers. Because much like the artist, ask a mathematician, let's say, because numbers are beautiful. They're worthy of being studied. That's, that's not practical at all. <laughs> it's theoretical. So where other disciplines can use the mathematics or use the physics to apply, then that's practical. That's always it's kind of a trick question. So, um, do you know what the difference between something objective versus subjective? Wait, can we stop a little bit? Absolutely. If lots of it didn't exist, science wouldn't exist? Yeah, what do you guys think about that? If philosophy didn't, she had asked, if philosophy didn't exist, would science exist? Because we would just agree on the same thing, and yeah, it's going to be really interesting to we'll go over just a bit um, the history of science. You'll see. That's an excellent question. See, you've already anticipated that you need to pay attention. You need a little start. Answering this question will help answer exactly what you were asking. So if somebody says, that's objective fact, no, that's subjective. Well, what do people mean by that? The difference subjective and objective is biased. Uh, subjective has more of a it's more biased. Objective is just the fact of it. Yeah, do you see that I actually put? Um, so objective, like factual, subjective, Hey man, that's your opinion. Did you ever see Big Lebowski? Hey man, that's like your opinion, man. Um, yeah, it's subjective. Okay. Now let me give you some different examples, and you tell me which category does it go into: objective, factual, or subjective opinion. Um, the Earth, let's see, rotates around a sun. Well, the Earth has a sun. Uh, Pad Thai is the best tasting food in the universe. Um, let's see. Give me another. Give me some other examples. I want to hear what you have to say. Um, and don't say if it's objective or subjective, and then we'll let the rest of the class. My best friend is a high school teacher. She's the best high school teacher ever. Subjective. Subjective. Because um, somebody else says, oh, is the worst teacher I have made. Or, yeah, you could have, as you put, um, how do you state it? Uh, no, no, that you said objective is lack of bias. Yeah. Notice? Yeah, give me some other examples. Well, I'm right back. Mm -hmm. What words do you see in those two words? Yes. Now think about in when we were in grade school learning uh, grammar. The subject 
is always someone. Yes, a person. Objects. Well, let's look at this. The Earth rotates around the Sun. And my, what, am, what am I talking about? What am I modifying? The Earth rotates around the Sun. The Earth, is it a person, a subject? An object, we're talking about two objects. Now if I say, yeah, how ties the best case to the universe? What am I talking about? What am I modifying? Really, I'm modifying taste. And where does taste exist? On the bottom of my shoe? Oh, man, I just stepped in some, some taste. Ugh! No, that's kind of weird, isn't it? That would be a weird way to talk. Uh, it's not an object. Taste exists in what? In your brain, getting from the yeah, but th that's really interesting. For example, how many people like hot spicy peppers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that how hot can you go? Curry that comes with a warning. Curry. What's another? There's a uh, hotter one too. The have you seen the YouTube video, uh, Klaus the Chili Pepper Eater? Yeah. Yes. Right? He's so funny. He's like this game. He's like this game. He gets he's like other people to eat. Yeah, but what's so funny, you know that phrase, brothers in arms, right? That, you know, you could be fighting for a war that you totally disagree with. Um, you talk to people and it's like, we're not fighting for, they're fighting for each other, right? Because in trauma, when you go through something, it bonds, it brings you together. Have you suffered? Then you can relate. So this kind of happens when you cross the chili pepper. Um, they go through this trauma, right? <laughs> and they're all like, they're like, oh, brother. <laughs> they're like holding each other, hugging each other. It's like, we did it, right? Or we're trying to get through it together or something. I think it's hilarious that. But that's interesting. So you eat the chili pepper, okay, an object, and it produces within you the phenomenal experience of, by God, it's 300 or 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, is that really? If you put a thermometer on your tongue, is it 500 degrees Fahrenheit? It's subjective. Right? You're not actually getting hotter. It just feels that way. Why do I feel that way, Every time I eat a pepper, I feel like I get hotter. Well, we have to wait till we get to the end. We can't talk about that. But uh, <laughs> if you're in fight or flight, like your brain can't tell you. It's like, oh my god, we're going to die. We should probably stop it. It's trying to get you to stop doing the thing. Yeah. But, and it's usually it's the acids that are producing um, that chemical reaction in the brain, which produces the subjective phenomena within you of fire. The fire sale. Now, you've never seen the uh, rest of the I'm just going to keep throwing out the references. If you haven't seen it, then you can watch the moment. I have a question. Um, <laughs> based on that, uh, I mean, that you really don't get hot when you like a chili or something. So that would be subjective, right? Um, so I think we're trying to illustrate examples of which taste seems to be subjective. So if you switched it around, though, saying that your body does the hot yeah, it's like, oh, I jumped in the fire and I got hot. It's like, yeah, because that's objectively true. <laughs> okay, it's not uh, an opinion, man. Uh, because I mean, think about it. we can all taste uh, the same object, and it all tastes different to us. Name a food that you don't like. I love mushrooms. Isn't that interesting? Does it change magically when I enter it in your mouth and it's something different? No, it's just a different experience. Uh, yeah, hope not. <laughs> so, that seems to be correct. Those things that have to do with um, blue is my favorite color. 
or blue is the best color. Well, no, that's a preference that exists in you, and it doesn't. Now, just because, well, I'll hold up on that. Um, so, this, now we're getting into certitude. Does science guarantee more certitude, or does philosophy guarantee more certitude? So, you, all of you thought that, have, have mentioned for the most part, that philosophy seemed to be more subjective, sort of have biases or personal preferences, um, and science is objective. By the way, do objective facts change? Really? Well, then is it objective? Well, then how do we define? Now, sometimes we have to have time qualifications. Um, let's see. Fido is alive. That may or may not be a true statement. Um, Fido is alive right now. No, Fido died three days ago. So that becomes an important thing. The Earth rotates around the sun right now. Is that, can that change? Or let's go to mathematics a bit easier. One plus one equals two, pretty easy, right? Is that subjective? Is that your opinion, man? Or is it objective? Objective. Can that change? No. No. So traditionally, objective fact. If it changes, now here's a big, uh, important distinction. You can think certain things to be objective. I might think that objective is to be objective. And then I find that I'm wrong, and I have to modify it. Well, does that mean it was objective, or I was just wrong in thinking so? Yeah, so by definition, objective facts don't change. Otherwise, they're not objective. It's just by definition. So we could think it might be. That's, that's a part of thinking sometimes. Too. But yeah, we go to clearer examples. We philosophers love to use mathematics because there's not much room for disagreement, and it's quite clear as providing examples for things that might not be so clear. Yeah. Well, we know one plus one is a terrible every day. We'll talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. Answer four, five. Could you know anything? If everything changed, left meant right. It's like backwards, upside down world. Every everything changed. Uh, which is kind of interesting because isn't that kind of written in uh, Lewis Carroll's House of Wonder? Everything starts proportion changing. So I have a philosophy professor in undergraduate asked her a really interesting question. Now, Alice is growing. She knows she's growing because everything around her is not. So she has a point of comparison. If the whole universe, everything in it, was growing in proportion, would you be able to tell? If so, by what means? You have the same rate of knowledge. I'm going to say no, because it's still in the middle of the universe. So, if that's all the time you want, you can tell me. Yeah, this is a question of the knowledge. We might have to get pulled off and get until we get to Einstein and start uh, with Einstein goals and then change it. Yeah, don't you know I'm actually going to be teaching? Tell them, didn't I teach you Einstein's relativity? Oh, yeah. Newton, um, Galileo. Yeah, you guys are going to be a master of all. Yeah, and then we go to a special award. I'm a philosopher. Um, here's an interesting question. Does science require agreement within the society as a whole? No. Yes. I would say yes. Go into a chemistry classroom and ask them how many more they say. Are we going to get different answers? No. There's 117 or 19. Or 19. Really, to determine whether that someone would be able to be in a
I'm generally speaking because you'll have scientific theory, so I mean established science. Oh, okay. Because I, I was thinking more about, like, you know, traces of space is real. Really? Church of God's space. I mean, <laughs> join my cult, dude. Join the cult. <laughs> That's crazy. These are not the good people. There's the space. My great grandma doesn't think the moonlight is happening. Well, yeah, that's what we'll talk about that. That's kind of interesting. I've kind of thought about it too because, you know, they wanted to be the rapture thing. I found a crazy video, I'm just going to put this out there, where, um, so they were in, what is the, uh, I'm thinking, there's the outside belt that you go outside of uh, is the outer space. Gosh, what can I remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so outside is the radiation. So the, the space station's inside of that oh. stuff, um, so they're not out given the radiation. And it was so crazy. So they were like, uh, they were talking about what NASA is working at is they're trying to get, because the radiation is so strong they can't go out there inside the pipe belt. And that they were like, one day we hope that we'll be able to get our technology so that we can actually go to Mars. And I was like, what? <laughs> well, and they kept talking this way. And I'm like, oh. I'm like that's kind of weird. That uh, I'm just throwing out there that that could be some evidence conflict that they can. Why are the NASA people up there saying our technology is not up to par? That we'd be just irradiated with radiation and all die, but we're hoping we're moving to the direction that we can actually go to the moon. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, right. I mean, well, I mean, are they meaning just like going there, like for example, and then coming back, or are they meaning to walk the They said they cannot go outside, They're, all of them were saying they can't go outside the belt. They don't have the technology to do that because they'd be fried. Um, and then you see. The, all the Apollo, and it's made out of tin foil, it's like, right? And they're like trying to build like all this, so and all I'm saying is it at least should give you just pause to, look, don't be a gullible idiot. Which is interesting because do you know if you look up in the dictionary, gullible is actually spelled with a Z? Really? Absolutely. Gotcha. <laughs> So it's good to be skeptical, okay, to test the bounds, right, of what people are saying. Now, you don't want to go so far that you need healthy skepticism, okay, because otherwise you'll probably just die, okay? You need to eat food. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think I need to. Well, that might be good for a conversation, but if you actually carry that out, and you just keep that kind of stuff up. Uh, not going to believe it. Uh, uh, you're not going to survive. You're going to die, dude. <laughs> There's, um, because of the human Barbie, she, she did an interview where she's like, I don't actually eat. I exist off of the particles in the air. And people are like, how does that work? No, that's what they like, prove yeah. to us. You, know, you can't prove that you only eat air. You couldn't if you didn't eat for three days. Or the famous one, you can't prove that I can't. Yeah. It's like, that's a fallacy. You're an idiot. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll teach you. Um, the idiot fallacies. How to identify idiots in 10 easy steps. Okay, you committed this fallacy. Okay, now be loving about this, okay? Because you can be right and uh, still be a jerk. Okay. So this is discretion technique. Okay. So what do you say we pick up? Oh, one last question. Does philosophy require agreement within society the whole yeah. So if you walk into a philosophy classroom and ask a philosophy professor um, philosophical questions, does God exist? Is there a soul? Does the universe have a beginning? Okay, we're going to get universal conformity. Might that be a reason? And I'll leave you with this, and then we'll return to it next time after uh, you read the two homework assignments for over the weekend. Okay, that are up on the. One of them is Jonathan Lear's A Desire to Understand. That's a PDF book. That, unless you're just, you know, gun, really crazy gun ho don't read the book. Read the first chapter. It's called The Desire to Understand. Uh, Frederick Popplestone's a bit more difficult article. Just try to get through what 
book, with anything, difficulty usually with new subjects and vocabulary. You have a new kind of vocabulary. Vocabulary. I encourage um, students get a notebook or on your computer anytime that don't be like I was when I was a kid. I was like, oh, what does that work? Um, and my mom said, look it up, right? I think I kind of got the context of and I just move on and get myself into more confused. <laughs> when you come across a word that you don't know, let's start making a little glossary. Okay? Because those words are going to come up over and over again in philosophy. Look it up. Uh, Dictionary of Philosophies, you can have one online, you can order one. They're great because oftentimes you'll never find these technical words in a normal dictionary. But start making, uh, writing out the definition. You will see that you know half of the difficulty will start to be removed just because oh, I know what these words mean now. That's not obscure and ambiguous to me anymore. So Frederick Copelson will have a lot of words, philosophies I see in some article, that you're not going to know. That's going to be hard. You pop through it, it's okay, I'll explain everything. Do your very best. After you read those two articles, I want you to write notes that I talked to you about. You will keep those notes, but you will bring them into class next Monday, and I will give you, I'll see if you have them, give you points, homework points for those, and then we can use, discuss that. But we'll leave off here, remind us to come back here, that it seems what you're saying is that go into a science classroom and ask a science question, and for the most part, you're going to get a universe, uh, uh, yeah, which tends to make us think that's because it's objective. You don't have a bunch of people saying, oh yeah, maybe there's a sun, I don't know, okay, that's your opinion. It's no, there's a sun out, okay? If it's objective, if it's not based on the way that you see things, then you can have a kind of third person point of view all Confirm, hey, okay, I'm not just saying that sound right. Like you are too. Am I crazy? <laughs> oh, yeah, because it's objective fact. So there might be a link between universal agreement as a whole, universal disagreement. Could that possibly be a reason why people might say philosophies tend to be more on the subjective side? Because there's more disagreement? Does disagreement mean no objective fact? I want you to think about that. We'll return to that on Monday. Um, if there's any questions, you can write me over the week. You can, um, for those of you that need to get your app codes, those of you who came in late for attendance, come see me. Could you hit that?